This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the latest, the freshest edition of Tiger's Talk with Churko and Company. I'm your host, Vito Jerome Churko, for episode 68 of Tiger's Talk. Doc is alongside me as usual, my sidekick, my partner in crime, that is. He is the Doc from Doc and Jock, John Macaroon. John, how's it going? Vito, always good to see you. What's on your mind? I know it's right dab, uh, smack dab in the middle of the Major League Baseball hot stove. Winter meetings are coming up next week. Lots to talk about with the Detroit Tigers. Still swirling trade rumors about where the destination is going to be for Justin Verlander, maybe. J.D. Martinez, I think one of his clubs that has been rumored that he might go to, has been shut with the uh, addition that the Mets made uh, in signing and re-signing Yoannis Cespedes. So I'm very interested to get your takes on what you've been uh, looking up in terms of baseball. Baseball, what's been uh, probably the biggest news story or what have you been pe- uh, paying attention to lately in baseball? Well, still salivating over what the next big move will be for the Tigers and going into the winter meetings, as you said, next week when a lot of stuff starts circulating, really starts getting hot. The hot stove, in so many words, heats up to the max during the winter meetings. And that's when you see the big trades being made, Doc. So what will that be for the Tigers? It looks like they're willing to deal J.D. Martinez for not the biggest haul. Because after this upcoming season, he will become an unrestricted free agent. So a guy that just is available to all teams. And meaning he will have a lot of suitors. And it's already been noted by you and I in the past that it looks like the Tigers won't be able to resign him. So knowing that, they think they have to deal him now and get something for him instead of letting him go. You know, for nothing when free agency does occur after next season. So it sounds like the haul they're expecting for J.D. is not as immense. Where the other players available right now by the Tigers, they're looking for huge hauls. And that's what Buster Olney recently reported of ESPN.com and ESPN, ESPN's MLB Insider. And I got to trust him. He's hugely, you know, highly respectable. A highly respectable source about everything Major League Baseball with trades, free agency rumors. So it sounds like the Tigers are going to wait out for a big haul in order to deal Justin Verlander, Miguel Cabrera, and even Ian Kinsler, I heard. And then I saw yesterday as well a uh, recent rumor about Victor Martinez being looked at by teams and maybe not being highly targeted because of his age, because of his hefty contract at his advanced age. But still, it sounds like there are suitors out there. Maybe not a ton of them, Doc, for VMart services, but at least a few of them. And VMart, though, would be a guy that I would expect the Tigers kind of just to dump the salary of, meaning they won't get a huge coop of young arms or young players in return for VMart because of his advanced age. And because, if you look at what he did in the second half of last year, it wasn't as great as his first half in 2016. So I think you're not going to get a ton for him, but the Tigers are going to wait out as long as they can, it sounds like, to get a huge deal in return for JV, Miguel Cabrera, Ian Kinsler, if they even choose to deal those three guys, Doc. No, I think what's happening with Alavila, and it makes a very uh, makes a, a, a great amount of sense, is that when teams are, are calling you know, to discuss who the Tigers potentially are going to trade, Alavila has to throw out some names, and he's p- kind of putting out there that, hey, I want a lot in return for my guys. And that makes sense, but what's likely going to happen is he's going to probably have to come down a little bit on his asking price for some of these guys because otherwise you're just going to end up keeping them. But I think at first what you want to do is you want to throw out your kind of ridiculous ideas in terms of maybe getting the the top one, you know, 1A prospect in the organization and maybe a, a, a guy that contributes regularly to on the starting lineup of the ball club. But then once it gets closer to the winter meetings, it gets closer to the time where the roster is going to take shape. I think Alavila is going to make some deals that are fair. And so I think that Alavila is just trying to save face, and he's trying to do the absolute best that he can to get rid of some of these guys. But some interesting news and notes has been kind of kind of swirling around regarding what's been going on with some of the trade partners that the Tigers are likely to work with. And an interesting note that I thought was kind of, I don't know if it was appropriate or not, but it seems like... Major League Baseball Commissioner Rob Manfred has kind of put a mandate on the Dodgers and has said, listen, you guys have spent so much money, you guys need to kind of look at 
what you're doing with your payroll. And it looks like the Dodgers might have to start hauling, uh, letting go like the Tigers of some of their guys. And so it might be something where we might be able to work something out with the Dodgers because they're kind of in a pinch in terms of their spending. And they spent so much money in the last four years on player salaries that the Major, major League Baseball is start, starting to look at it. So it might be something where you want to kind of focus on what the Dodgers are doing and who you can pick up from that organization. But if they're not willing to take on salary, Doc, let me counter with this point, then they're not going to deal for Ian Kinsler. They're not going to deal for Justin Verlander. And they could use both guys, especially a second baseman, in my opinion, as they already have Clayton Kershaw at the top of their rotation. But how about JV and Clayton Kershaw, one-two punch at the top of that Dodgers at Roto? Every fifth day, how good would that be? And I want to punch as they head into the postseason to have that dynamic do up the front of their rotation for a playoff series. That could help them. That could be the difference maker, Doc, in allowing the Dodgers to get to the World Series, which they haven't been in now, haven't won in a long time there in L.A. in Dodger Blue. So they could use an upgrade for second base for starting pitching and. Verlander would be the answer for that, for the upgrade in the rotation, and Kinsler big time for their second base void. But the thing is, if they're thinking about shedding salary, they're not going to deal for Ian Kinsler. They're not going to deal for Justin Verlander. And you made the point about how Alavila, you know, we said he's holding out right now for the biggest offer possible for Kinsler, for the likes of Verlander, Miguel Cabrera as well. Well, you said he might have to come down with this price, his asking price at some point, maybe as the winter meetings, as they progress, maybe later into the offseason, maybe into January, maybe when, so when the new year hits and we get closer to spring training. But the thing is, is that this is a good sign that Al Avila is not simply looking to cut salary immensely and instead is looking to attain valuable resources for the future that the Tigers can build with to get better in the long-term future. So it's better to see this that he's that he's holding out for big-time offers of young players for his top major league guys, rather than him looking just to shed salary. As, remember, the Marlins did at one point when they had a fire sale. They've had numerous, you know, more than one fire sale. So those teams that have have had fire sales, you don't want to see the Tigers go down that same route. And the thing is, it doesn't look like they're taking that approach, which is very good to see for me as a Tigers fan. And I think strategically, too, when you look at the Tigers and what they can do in the long-term future, they can better themselves by dealing these guys and dealing these guys for young players that are going to be major league ready in a year or two or two or three years instead of just trading these guys for pretty much nothing and in the process dumping their salaries. That's not the way to go, and it looks like they're not doing that, which I'm totally glad about, Doc. See, the Dodgers, what's happened is under this new organ, um, this new organization that's been running them, they, in the last four years, have spent damn near a billion dollars on player salary. And what's happened is in 2015, the Dodgers spent $300 million on salary. And so that's just way too much money. And so with that, they're kind of looking at the Dodgers payroll to be around $200 million this year. And so what's going to happen is they got a couple guys they want to sign and re-sign in the, in the organization that they want to keep. But if they trim $100 million, what's happening is what's going to happen is they're going to let go of some players, but they're also going to, some of the players that they've paid money to that are no longer on the books are going to come off. So it's going to be easier for the Dodgers to get down to $200 million. But eyebrows were raised when in 2015 they spent $300 million. That sets off huge luxury tax payments. Um, it's, it, it's not a good thing, especially when the club is taking on debt. And they got to make sure that they're a financially viable club. So they're under a mandate. And so you might be willing, the Dodgers what might kind be willing. Of, Really quick, sorry to cut you off, but mm-hmm. what kind of mandate? The Dod- talking about a mandate? The mandate. The mandate. I know what you're talking about. I'm joking with you. <laughs> but what a word that is. And if Rob Manfred, the commissioner at Major League Baseball, did absolutely order that mandate, you know, or issue that mandate, then we know the Dodgers, the Dodgers have to act. Have to act on cutting salary. And immensely, I keep using that adjective today, but it sounds like they have to cut some salary. And reduce debt. Because the thing is, though, they're not going to cut their big players from the from the books. They're not going to get rid of Kershaw or their big market guys that are really highly valuable ball players. Uh, they might deal a guy such as Yasiel Puig, who's not making a ton of money. They've looked to deal him before, and he's this wild horse that is just up and down, you know, highly uncontrollable because you don't know what you're going to get out of him. And then he has his antics as well on and off the ball field, and that can be a little bit too much for the Dodgers to handle at times. And you know what L.A. Blue, once again, would really benefit from is having, well, you throw Kershaw, 
the left-handed ace, and then Justin Verlander, the right-handed ace, and they have the prospects to attain Justin Verlander, and that might put them over the top. So would they be willing to deal that? When, remember, last offseason, they allowed Zach Greinke to walk. He joined the Diamondbacks via free agency, and they could have re-signed him. There was thought that they would re-sign Zach Greinke to a long-term deal. They passed on that because, you know what? They thought he was making way too much money, and the deal that he got with the D-backs. And I think that was a sign of what maybe is to come now in their cutting of payroll to, you know, around that $200 million uh, amount. And I think they want to get down to that based on what you're saying as well, Doc. And uh, that's why I think they let Zach Grinke walk last offseason. And that's why I think they're going to take steps or measures not to attain maybe those big salary guys this offseason either, which puts them out of the market out of the playing field for Justin Verlander then. And I wonder, I wonder if there's a possibility still of them attaining Ian Kinsler, with that being said. Kinsler not making nearly as much money as JV per season going forward. So Kinsler might be the guy they look to deal when it comes to Tigers' available players that are most valuable from the Tigers' roster in 2016. So I still think there is a at least a, a slim amount of hope that they do deal for Ian Kinsler. And if the Tigers get that to happen, they're going to bank... Uh, they're going to luck out uh, or make out like bandits. You know why? Because the Dodgers have a, a an immensely, I'm going to use that adjective once again, an immensely deep farm system. So the Tigers could really revamp their ball club really quick if they were to deal with the Dodgers. And I think even if the Dodgers don't swing a deal for Ian Kinsler, Doc, I think Kinsler still is very valuable on the market right now as teams are looking to upgrade at second base and as this free agent class has shown us already, is not very deep at many positions. And at second base, who are you going to go out and get? I think Kinsler is at the top of a lot of teams' wish lists with that being said. And wanted to kind of transition into some J.D. Martinez talk here now, Doc. And the Mets, as you said, were able to come to terms on a four-year deal with Ioannis Cespedes, making him a $110 million man. That's a lot of change, huh? to spend for Yohannes Cespedes, who gets hurt every single season, has like one great half and then not another great half. So not two great halves together, it seems like. But he's gotten better, it seems like, more consistent since coming over to the Tigers, really. And the Tigers dealt him uh, at the trade deadline, you know, to the Mets. And in 2015, he turned it on, had a great second half, was a hero in New York Mets land because of the fact that he helped them get to the playoffs, then to the World Series. And then this past season, he led the Mets in many major your offensive uh, statistical categories, I believe, in both home runs and runs batted in. So Cespedes is the man in Queens, and that's why the Mets signed him to this hefty contract. And it was talked about that the Mets were looking at and looking at G.D. Martinez strongly. Now, with Cespedes signed long-term for that big of a deal, and you have Jay Bruce still on the books, Curtis Granderson as well, their outfield is full. And I don't see the Mets now trading for J.D. Martinez to sum it all up, Doc, which was a rumor at one point. Yeah, it was a rumor, and it would have been a nice landing spot. But I guess the way it was looked at is he was basically, J.D. Martinez was going to be the fallback option, was going to be the guy that would be signed if a deal with Yoannis Cespedes did not happen. He was the guy that they targeted. The Mets wanted Cespedes to come back. It seemed like a good fit early on. And yes, you're exactly right. If he stays healthy, though, I think... If you would look at it, I think you would agree that Cespedes is a little bit better at this point in time than J.D. Martinez. Not a a significant amount, but slightly better overall player in terms of his ability to, you know, smash the deep ball, clutch hitting, and things like that. But the margin is super thin. So if they didn't sign Cespedes, J.D. Martinez would have been a great replacement. But I think he'll find uh, a suitable home, and I think they'll get fair market value for him because a guy that can hit that powerfully and a guy that, you know, especially when he came back from injury, was still able to kind of do some things. I think that he's going to be a valuable commodity and one that Al Vila should covet and hopefully get something in the bullpen or maybe another starter for him. But J.D. Martinez, I, I do believe, won't be in a Tigers uniform when 2017 starts. I think that's to say the least that he won't be. I don't think there's any chance almost that he will be a Tiger again in 2017. And I still think the same thing is true for Ian Kinsler. I don't think either of them will be Tigers in 2017. And the Mets maybe will make a push still for J.D. Martinez, Doc. And it's because of the fact that the rumors are that they're looking to deal at Jay Bruce, who came over for the Mets in the second half, you know, via a trade deadline move. And they thought he would be the player that would put them over the top. And he didn't help out that much. 
down the stretch. That is Jay Bruce. I'm talking about who they got from the Cincinnati Reds. Had a great first half. Not nearly as good of a second half. And down the stretch, his production was iffy. It wasn't very consistently productive. And that's why I believe right now they're looking to move this man who is Jay Bruce, who will turn 30 in April of next year and who will be a free agent after this upcoming season. He signed through 2017, and I think they believe he won't be worth, you know, the most bang for the buck if they do attempt to resign him. And he'll be asking for a lot more money then, with that being said, than he's really worth. So they're looking to already move him. And if they were to move him to a squad such as the Blue Jays, who are rumored to be looking at him right now, well, if that is the case, guess what? The Mets will be back in the market for J.D. Martinez, Doc. So still the possibility there of J.D. then going to the Metropolitans after all that was said about, well, because they signed Yohannes Cespedes to that deal, that they would be out of the picture for J.D. Doesn't seem like that, totally at least. And it will be interesting to see if the Tigers do swing a deal for J.D. during the winter meetings next week. That could be the time when they deal him and when they deal Ian Kinsler. And I'll make a prediction right, uh, right now. Doc, and I don't think it's going out on a limb. But I think one of those two guys, J.D. or Ian Kinsler, will be dealt during the winter meetings next week. What are your thoughts on that happening? You think that it's going to be wheeling, dealing time right away out of the gate? I don't even know if there's going to be a winter meetings. we got to pay attention to what's going on with the CBA. I don't like the early rumblings from what I'm hearing. I think they're close on some negotiating ploys and things like that, but I don't like the fact that right away the first thing we're kind of talking about is the um, the issues between the union and, you know, Major League Baseball. they got to get that straightened out, or there might not be a winter meetings at all. But should they get to that point and everything works out, I do believe that, yeah, they're going to have to take, you know, they got to take action pretty quickly. I think that uh, Alavila's done his due diligence, and it will behoove him to start the process of rebuilding this club sooner rather than later because, you know, if you wait to the last minute, you might not be able to get the deals that you want done. So it's very important to make those connections to get the most value that you can for the guys that you're letting go. And I think Al Avila's and, – and I asked Adam, and I think I'm going to ask you, do you trust Al Avila that he's going to make solid moves – in this offseason for 2017. Now, we all know whether it be a rebuild or a retool, whatever you want to call it, the club in 2017 is going to look different, and their, their, their playing style is going to be different with a more focus on advanced saber metrics. They're going to be looking at a different type of player to expect different type of results. And I'm hoping that Brad Osmus can imp- steadily improve as a manager and really look at what um, you know, what Sabermetrics tells you to do in certain situations and to improve how he uses starters in the bullpen. But he won't. You don't think so? Nope. 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 Wrong. Like he, Donald Trump said. He will kept not saying in his debates. Uh, wrong. He will not like evolve. Wrong. He will wrong. not evolve, huh? <laughs> wrong. But do you believe that Al Avila will surround him with the proper talent that he'll go out there and field a team and bring in a 25-man roster that's going to help this ball club at least be competitive in 2017? Are you dealing with... Short-term memory loss. We've talked about this too on the podcast before we actually have. But oh, what I said time. before mm-hmm. is that Al Avila, I think, can actually help out with the revamping of the team more than he can help the Tigers become a winner in 2017. Okay. And I think they're looking not to win as much in 2017 as they are to revamp the roster for the long-term future, to get younger, mm-hmm. and obviously to lessen the payroll. So I think they'll do all that this offseason, and then come 2018, 2019, they might be in better position to be true contenders in the AL Central. So I think Al Avila will jumpstart that this offseason. And as he said, remember, he said, this might take two or three years. It might be a long-term process. And I get it because you know what? For what they're looking to get in return for JV, for Miguel Cabra, for Ian Kinsler, for J.D. Martinez, for Justin Upton, for even Victor Martinez possibly. Well, you know what? It might not be out there what they want to attain for those guys right now. So Because the teams might not be willing to give up as much as they want right now. Meaning that's why the long-term process is true probably will come to fruition as well. So those guys might not be dealt until 2018, some of them, and maybe even until after that for some of them as well. But you know he wants to get the process started and will jumpstart it. And I believe as soon as next week during the winter meetings by dealing either Ian Kinsler or J.D. Martinez, Doc. Now I also want to ask you this in terms of maybe Chris Illich and what the Tigers are doing because there is a quiet rumbling going on around town and people are debating actually why is it that 
a billion dollar company is actually slashing payroll. Yeah. Now, I can understand the potential to not want to go from 200 million to 300 million. Do you trust that it is a business decision that the threshold that the Tigers are uh, meeting to make money is around 150 to 170 million dollars with the declining attendance, with operating costs, with the fact that also the Illiches are putting money out to um, build a new Red Wing stadium? Do you agree and do you believe that the organization really should be slashing payroll? And and do you think that a team like the Tigers being in the market that it's in can sustain a payroll if they you know get 3 million fans around $200 million? Because I feel like that's a that was a little bit high, but at the same time, it, I'm interested to see where they're going to shake out in terms of what the final number is going to be. Is it going to be 150, 140, 160? I'm interested to see because it is an interesting question to look at is why is a billionaire – running a sports team cutting payroll why can't he sustain the payroll that he has and i know it has a lot to do with the attendance slipping but do you think that that maybe the organization is going in the wrong direction by slashing payroll and uh going in this direction well yeah absolutely i've told you that before too because i think the tigers should still try to contend not just jumpstart the revamping process for the future for 2018 for 2019 and i think he's making a business decision that is uh, might be going awry, might not be the best long-term solution, and because of the fact that he's operating as if the Tigers are a small business that he's running. They're not. So he's acting like he's in a budget crunch when he's not once again. He's cutting payroll simply to cut payroll to cut a few costs and save a few bucks. He's not saving a ton of money, nor are the Tigers in the state as a franchise where they have to save a lot of money, even though I know the attendance numbers have been going down the last two seasons now and will be going down maybe severely in 2017 because the Tigers are jump-starting this revamping process to get younger for the long-term future. So they might be even losing more ticket sales, losing more people from showing up to Comerica Park every single home game in 2017. And that's why I think Chris Illich, he has that in mind and wants to cut all this payroll, slash all this salary from the books. But the thing is, is that I think he's doing it in, or to an extent, or is aiming to do it to an extent where it's not totally financially savvy or the best business decision when you're running not a small business but a corporation with the Tigers, right? I mean, they are a big-time business, and they're worth a lot of money. We know that much as well. So what he's doing to cut a few bucks, which is a few million dollars, and, you know, for him, well, it's still not, it's, it would be, it would equate to us cutting only like a few bucks, right, from our daily expenditures. And he wants to do this, and I think at times that he's just doing this because, well, you talked about it, Little Caesars Arena for the Red Wings' new arena come 2017, and they probably want to save up for that, put a lot into it, and they already have invested a lot of money, will invest more money, and want to, I think, invest more money into the Red Wings. But I've told you, I think that's a bad business plan as well because of the fact that I think the Red Wings right now are less likely to win in the near future than the Tigers are. The Tigers right now, as they stand, are in a better state to win now than the Red Wings are to win in the present in the present time that we have. And that's why I think he is making a bad decision. So I don't think it's totally worth it to cut what? I mean, it's going to be to get the Tigers to 175, 170, 167 mil total as, you know, for the payroll. But in the grand scheme of things, it's not like he's cutting a ton for himself you know, or saving a lot of money. It equates, as I said, to us saving a few bucks, right? So would we want to do that if we had in mind the long-term future of our of what we're dealing with? So whatever our, you know, company is that maybe we're running and, you know, our small business, if we had the best interests in mind of that small business, I don't think we would just be cutting a few bucks. And that's what he's doing with his big corporation that's worth, how much are the Tigers worth now? A billion dollars, right? That's what he's doing with this big-time corporation when it's not totally necessary. So I don't think he's keeping the best interests of the Tigers in mind with that being said. Yeah, at least totally at least. Because I know he's helping out with the getting younger, and Tigers need that. But I think right now, if they weren't to do that, they'd be all right and be in a state to win in 2017. But you do agree they they have to get younger and they have to kind of relook at the organization because I feel like they you know made made the effort they made the pitch to try and get the World Series it just didn't happen and so you go okay if we're spending two hundred is it better for us in the long term to spend three hundred for one year of success and then deconstruct or is it better to kind of start the process now 
and begin the process of looking at the organization as a whole and maybe to function a little bit more efficiently, whereas you get more bang for your buck. Because at $200 million and, and where the Tigers are at, you kind of need a ring. You need a, a, at least to make the postseason. And when you don't, it, it makes you really kind of look at, okay, I don't, you know, in terms of business, you don't really want to keep putting out good money after bad. And if you can get similar result, because the key factor is, I don't think the Tigers organization is going into the rebuild going, well, if we spend 170, we're not going to make the postseason. I think they're going to try their absolute best to field a team that plays a little bit differently with this new manager and new manager. With this, uh, yeah, uh, old manager. Yeah, Brett Austin. At this point, he's the he's the oldie new, but not a goodie. Yeah, yeah, he's he the, better be of a new mindset. I don't think he will be. I know you were trying to say that he might change his yeah. ways now, but I don't think he will in your number four. Okay, at least enough. No, no, I mean he's the he's the newest style manager that they're trying to go with in terms of young and players coach and looking at numbers as well. Trying to make them, yeah, do yeah, that. yeah, and see what they can do with that kind of payroll. I think that uh, you know, given the fact that what they've given him. He has kind of handled it and kept the locker room, and you know, by all accounts, the players do kind of have fondness for Brad Ausmus. I think that they're trying to look at using the money much more wisely, and I think I'm going to be interested to see. Now, whether it's going to be successful or not, that, that's yet to be seen, and we'll see how the fans react to it if they start off the 2017 season not as successfully. But I agree that uh, after you go three to five years spending a ton of money and you don't get uh, significant postseason runs and you don't sniff a World Series ring, then it's time to reevaluate everything. And I think that that's what most organizations do. But there are a lot of questions, we can admit that, that people are wondering, where's this money going and why isn't he willing to put forth a little bit more? And uh, I guess from this podcast, we, what we can say is, Chris Illich is not Mike Illich. It's a different leadership style. You better get used to it in that uh, you know the younger Chris Illich is going to be trying to maybe do things a little bit differently than his father. And we have to see what, how that's going to shake out. He's not a Tigers fan like Mike Illich. He, was, he grew up as a Tigers fan, wanted to play for the Tigers, played baseball. That was his lifelong dream to play for the Tigers. So it never panned out, but he wanted to win with the Tigers and cared about it deeply. Chris Illich, guess what, does not care about winning with the Tigers. He cares about the Red Wings. And don't you think that's almost a problem? We can talk about that after, that he is focusing more of his attention and his resources on the Red Wings winning now, it seems like, than with the Tigers winning now. And we'll talk more about that, as I said, after this quick commercial break here on Tigers Talk. Hey guys, it's Vito Churko from Top Cat Sales in downtown Royal Oak. Are you looking for team apparel for your high school, your club sports team, or your corporation? Well, if so, then look no further than Top Cat Sales, located on the east side of Main Street in downtown Royal Oak, between 11 and 12 Mile. Through founder and former University of Michigan quarterback John Wangler's leadership, Top Cat Sales has developed a tradition of selling and distributing custom Adidas team apparel with the very highest quality and the very best service. So get your organization, your school, or club team all in with Adidas today by going online to TopCatTeamSales.com. Once again, TopCat's website is TopCatTeamSales.com. And remember, do yourself a favor and follow TopCat Sales on Twitter today at Team TopCat. And back on Tigers Talk, episode 68 of the pod. Doc, always a pleasure to be with you. You're always looking great. I'm always, I hope, looking great, right? As nobody is looking at us, which is good probably too. You know, it's always a benefit of doing a podcast or a radio show that's not simulcast. I know a lot of radio shows now are simulcast. But anyways, to get back on track here about the Tigers and the fact that, you know what, we know Chris Illich wants to trim payroll big time. Thing is, to what extent? And is it worth it when it looks like he's investing his resources into the Detroit Red Wings, who are not going anywhere this year? I don't care if I offend every single Red Wings fan out there, but it looks like the playoffs are a dream right now this season, Doc. And you as a Red Wings fan, as more of a prognosticator, a guy that looks at the Wings and what they do game to game, can you agree with me at least a little bit that the Wings right now are not in position to make the playoffs and the Tigers are in better position if they were to invest their resources in the Tigers and be more worth their while than investing their resources right now in the Wings to win? Well, actually, I disagree with you a little bit on your premise. I think both teams, if you just added a couple pieces, if the Tigers added one more reliable starter and one more, one more ball pen arm, you probably could get those five to ten extra wins that you need. And the Red Wings just need that defenseman that help out, that right-handed shot at defenseman. If they could find that guy, um, then they could probably be a little bit closer in the standings and maybe one more offensive threat. So the Wings, the Wings and Tigers are both closer to getting back into the postseason hunt. The, the tough part is, is that 
We're starved for championships. And so the gap between where the clubs need to be in terms of winning it all is very far, and it's widening. It's not shrinking. You know, I think both fan bases are realizing that it's going to be quite a while before the Wings host the Stanley Cup again and the Detroit Tigers get into the World Series again. And uh, it's just the nature of the beast. It is what it is. And you're definitely right. I agree with you that you can. it's obvious that when you're building uh, a multi-million dollar you know, new arena and you're partnering with another organization, that's going to take some of your time, some of your attention away from the goal. But I do believe that, you know, the Illiches have an organizational structure that's just, you know, really second to none. It's a good organization. They allocate, you know, people to work in, in proper positions. But the idea that people are really questioning Chris Illich is that is he devoted to the Tigers? I do believe he is. But he is also devoted to the new Red Rings project and other illich type holdings and other things. But you got to ask yourself: Is that what you want? Do you want um, an owner to have multiple teams in the same market? Can a, an owner um, have multiple teams and still devote the resources and attention that you think? So it sounds like you're saying that you think an owner probably should just have one team and focus exclusively on that, and that's probably what's best for the organization. You you have doubts that an owner of multiple teams can have success with multiple clubs. I think so right now, too, because of there is that salary cap now in the NHL, which when the Red Wings, I know, were really good, they were buying players left and right like the Yankees would do in Major League Baseball, who are not doing that now as well. But it was easier to win, I think, with two franchises back in the early 2000s or before, like in the 90s, mid-90s, late-90s, because the Wings didn't have to operate with a salary cap in mind, could just you know pay for as many good players as they wanted to, and the Tigers still can do that. And now my question for you is, I kind of brought it up before, Tigers have been, we know Al Avila came out and said it, and it is true that they've been operating above their means. But how much, once again, are they going to cut the salary of this Tigers roster going into 2017? Because if they only cut it a few mil, like to get to 170 or 167 in totality for the payroll, then would it be more worth it almost, Doc, to add a few mil, like five mil additionally to the payroll for 2017 than it is to cut it, you know, to get to 170 in totality for the payroll? Would it be more worth it for the Tigers, in 2017 at least, to add that little bit of payroll? Because I'll say this much. if Once again, I kind of brought up how if you were operating a small business, would you be willing to add you know, a few more thousand dollars or something? I know as a small business, you're not going to be making millions of dollars probably. So a few more thousand dollars to your entity instead of cutting maybe something. If you knew it would help out your your small business in the short term, would you add that little bit of money rather than cut a little bit of money? What do you think about that? Because, you know what, I think it's almost worth it, if you're not going to cut that much, to add some payroll. And I'm not saying, I know you brought up the point, well, are they going to bring their payroll to $250 million or north of that and get you close to $300 mil? They're not going to do that. So I'm saying only a little bit of additional payroll. If they were to do that going into 2017, would that be more worth it for the Tigers than to cut maybe 5 mil from the payroll or 10 mil? See, that's why it's very important also to pay attention to what's going on with this negotiation because the biggest contention is the Major League Baseball luxury tax threshold. Yep. It's been around $189 million the last couple seasons, so obviously they're going to go below that. The Tigers don't want to pay luxury tax. You know, the Dodgers are notorious. I think they paid around $40 million in luxury tax alone in 2015 or 2016. So the Tigers don't want to be in that category. They want to be well below the luxury tax threshold. And so that's why this negotiation might be contentious between baseball and the union is that the organizations kind of, you know, want to make sure that the luxury tax hold is in a, the, the threshold is in a spot that's really comfortable and, and, and to try to k- help keep competitive balance. So the the Tigers, I believe, are probably going to be, to answer your question, be in between 160 and 170. I think that's a fair payroll versus w- where they're at, and I think that will probably, um, I, I believe they probably want to go lower, but unfortunately, as much as you want to trade Justin Verlander, as much as you want to trade Miguel Cabrera, it's just not that easy. It's not like you wave your wand and snap your finger and boom, they're gone. They might have to eat the, the salaries and just 
keep them on the roster. And it wouldn't be the worst thing. They might actually win a little, but they might make the playoffs, might make a run. Hey, who knows if they get hot with JV, former Norris, one through three in the rotation, and a healthy Jordan Zimmerman. Guess what? They could make a run, potentially, at least past the first round, maybe even to the World Series if they get really lucky. And the threshold, you brought it up for the luxury tax. Well, it's been 189, like you said, Doc. So you know they're going to get below that. The thing is, how much... You know, lower. How much are they actually cutting? Because I just think, and they're not going to cut a ton to get below that number, then you add a little bit. You could probably still win, is my point, at 180 mil in totality as a payroll. Look at these teams that have won with much less payrolls. The Royals, the Indians in recent memory. Why couldn't you be at 175, 180 operating for your payroll and then still win? Because you could add some guys on the cheap like we've talked about. And still, you trade a guy or two this offseason, add a guy or two, like for the bullpen, and you still win at 175 or 180 mil for your payroll in totality. So I think they should look into that, and maybe that will be the case, Doc, because of what has been said by Alavila, that this will be a long-term process. And I really believe that it will be that, and I think we have to believe in the process. It's said about all these teams, you know, that are, that are stinko franchises too, and these fan bases are left to believe. And that's all they have to believe in is the process, like the 76ers. The Tigers might have the luxury, no pun intended here, of having a team that can win and also cutting some salary this offseason. So you can believe in the process while the team is still winning. And that will be the greatest thing in mankind for Tigers fans out there, such as myself and you, Doc, that they could trim some payroll this offseason but also win in the immediate future in 2017, maybe get a playoff spot as well, and then make a run or a semi-run you know, in the playoffs. So I think it's all possible. And that's why I'm willing to believe in the process as long as they don't have an immediate full-fledged fire sale, which I don't see them doing. And I think it's also because it's going to be so hard to move the contracts of Justin Verlander, as you noted, as we've both noted. Miguel Cabrera, same scenario with him. Too big of a contract really to move him and you got to get the right parts in return and because I believe they're willing to listen to all offers to get that to get the most parts and best parts in return that's why I think they're not totally skipping out on winning in 2017 which is great to hear I think for all of us doc as Tigers fans and we can look at some options for the Tigers too in a second but I wanted to give you the chance to have the platform now to speak about what I just said no, no, I listen, I agree exactly with what you're saying is that what's the that's the toughest question. That's what Elavila's job is going to be is to find that balance of what the team is going to be allowed to spend, what the number is going to be versus, you know, adding payroll and finding players that are going to help this ball club win. That's the competitive balance. That's the tough job that he has is because if the team starts off poorly, the, the tenants is not going to be there. You're not going to have that support. And remember, too, what also contributes to the club's payroll and that's TV revenue if the ratings are down, then how can Fox Sports Detroit continue to pump in money and Major League Baseball? I mean, they do get a ton of money from oh, the national shares. Oh, it's a huge contract for all the TV deals. You're right. Exactly. So nationally, they get a share of all that. All 30 teams yep. share that. But if, if the revenue's down at Fox Sports Detroit, then the next go-round, hey, maybe they're allocating some funds to start their own network, which obviously is not going to – if you start – if uh, the, the Tigers and Red Wings start their own channel, it's not going to be – you know, you don't start that off with pennies. You need a huge oh, yeah. funds – to start, uh, as we call, operating costs, to start a new venture like that. So you got to wonder as well as, you know, how much is going to be allocated for salary in 2017. And we, we have to wait and see what that final number is going to be. But uh, real quickly before we get to our last topic about a couple of pitchers that might be used in different roles in uh-huh. the Tigers organization, Big Vito's over under yep. 50%. Will there be a lockout? Oh, I say under 50%. They'll Don't believe it. Not to my Major League Baseball. Won't happen. No, I think they'll come to terms because they've got some great minds there working in Major League Baseball in the you know commissioner's office, including Rob Mann for the commissioner himself. So I think they will avoid the lockout, Doc. And I think uh, rightfully so for the state of the game because it's in a good state, really, with all the young talent, with the parity current in Major League Baseball as a whole. So I really like what they have done. I think they believe in what is going to happen with the young players too and how great the game can be in not only the immediate future but the long-term future. So I see the Tigers or Major League Baseball coming to a deal to avoid that lockout, Doc. All right. To end the podcast, we were looking at some of the articles around town regarding the Detroit Tigers and we came across Lynn Henning's article in the Detroit News and he kind of talked a little bit about um, the fact that potentially the Detroit Tigers could um, utilize um, Mike Pelfrey and Anibal Sanchez in different roles, similar to what the Indians did with their bullpen uh, in 2016. 
Do you have confidence that maybe if in late games, maybe the Tigers are up two to one in the sixth inning, that you bring in Mike Pelfrey and Anibal Sanchez in a role of a long reliever, two, three innings each to try and lock down leads? Because it's very, you know, it's very obvious that those two guys, their roles are going to be diminished in, in terms of starters. But in the long relief, I know Alex Wilson's been utilized in that role with some success. Shane Green's going to be looked at kind of as a guy. Bruce Rondon's going to have an, uh, an added role. Maybe Jimenez in the latter half of 2017 might develop that second pitch and earn his way up to the club. But do you see Pelfrey and Sanchez being reliable? That's the key. You can try throw them out there, but the key word is reliable. Would you rely on Mike Pelfrey and uh, Anibal Sanchez to be your longer-term relievers and utilize them more often in 2017? Well, you know what? Anibal Sanchez hasn't been too bad in those long relief roles out of the Tigers' pen in recent memory. He has some stuff from the past, too, that was, you know, the stuff that could allow you to miss bats. He had that, you know, strikeout potential. Now, at this point in his career, after two highly miserable years in a row as a Tigers starter, and then with the injuries, the injury bug that really caught up to him in 2015, and... As you get older, the injuries creep up on you even more, start piling up on your arm, and I think Anibal Sanchez is nearly washed up. I think Pelfrey has always been washed up, pretty much. It was a bad contract from the start, so I don't think he will be used out of the pen. I think Sanchez could be, and could be rightfully, like in in an efficient manner, because he could be at least more effective than Pelfrey in that role. Real, real quick, it was Chris McCoskey's article. McCoskey wrote that? Yep. Yes. So talking about those two, I think he's reaching for apples, oranges, just trying to get something because he has to produce an article. You know, they have to produce all these articles during the off season when everything's mundane and boring and dry and there's nothing out there really to write about. So they have to come up with these speculative articles such as that just to get the juices flowing for the baseball fans and Tigers fans out there. So I think the the likelihood of either really being effective long relievers is still under 50%, but who's more likely to be effective out of the pen in a long relief role? Anibal Sanchez, by far. Pelfrey, I say, has no shot. So with playing a game of big vetoes over under here I've got to give Anibal Sanchez a shot of like 30 percent Mike Palfrey a shot of five percent maybe 10 percent so basically his contract is going to be a wash it's going to be wasted absolutely it wasn't good from the start won't be good in 2017 either doc and that's why they should look for a bullpen option on the free agent market and we've talked about all these right-handed relievers you know possibilities for the pen and these guys might be good Reliable guys in 2017, but they're right-handers. Talking about Joe Jimenez, who might not be up right away come opening day. Shane Green, another right-hander. You got all these right-handed relief options. Um, Alex Wilson as well. K-Rod in the ninth inning, maybe even using him in a more flexible role as these other teams have adopted, such as the Indians, such as the Cubs, to get the best or the most bang uh, for the their buck out of their relievers in the late innings. So you got all these right-handed options, including Bruce Rondon, the fire-throwing Bruce Rondon, who might be the best he's ever been in 2017 after what we saw from him down the stretch. But we're lacking the reliable left-handed options. Justin Wilson wasn't great in the second half of the season. Blaine Hardy, do you really trust him going into 2017? Do you really trust Kyle Ryan to be really good again as he was in 2016, starting with opening day and really for the entirety of next season? I don't. I don't trust him. I don't trust Blaine Hardy. And I don't totally trust Justin Wilson. Now, I trust him the most, but you need really two effective left-handed relievers. So what the Tigers can do, I'm going to pinpoint a guy they can target in free agency this offseason. His name is Boone Logan, who's been around now Major League Baseball for a while, kind of as a journeyman reliever. And he's a lefty who, against left-handed bats in 2015 with the Rockies, he limited the opposition, these left-handed bats, to a 225 batting average and a 602 on base plus slugging percentage. Extremely effective against lefties in 2015. Then he followed that up, all of that effectiveness, in 2015 with an even better 2016 campaign against lefties as he limited left-handed bats with the Rockies in, once again this past season, to a 142, yes, a 142 batting average and a, a dismal, not just, you know, bad, but an extremely dismal OPS of 477. So in 2015, limiting, once again, left-handers to a 225 batting average, a 602 OPS, and this past season with the Rockies to a 142 batting average and a 477 OPS. That's the definition of extreme effectiveness against the batters that he is on a team to get out 
as a lefty. So you go out, you sign him on the cheap, you put him into your pen, and then you have a much better one-two punch of left-handed relievers to utilize out of your pen than they had. And really, it was Justin Wilson and for the first half, then Kyle Ryan for the second half. Neither was great for the entirety of the season. Kyle Ryan was the better of the two. But when you look at the FIP, Jay Wilson wasn't that bad. So he can be an effective lefty reliever, I believe, to a strong degree. He can be that effective lefty in 2017. But you need somebody to be his sidekick, you know, his partner in crime. And is Kyle Ryan that truly? I don't think you can trust in Ryan being that effective once again in 2017. And that's why you go out, you sign a veteran left-hander in Boone Logan. So that's my one guy that I'll pinpoint on this week's podcast that the Tigers should target. And if they do, if they do sign him too, they will be upgrading their bullpen in 2017, Doc, to say the least. Very good podcast. Vito, what are you targeting for the next couple episodes? Uh, obviously looking at the winter meetings, looking at uh, potential moves, maybe the CBA, what's going on with that. What are your interests? Are you going to also be looking at some of the minor league prospects, how they've developed in the Arizona Fall League and things like that? We'll be going to the winter meetings. We have a uh, one, no, we have, we have no tickets. I was going to say we have a one-way ticket to there, to the winter meetings, but no, we're not going to be able to do that. Wouldn't that be great? But I will be looking into really all the trades circulating, all the rumors that will be picking up steam as the winter meetings do progress next week. Doc, with that, my man, thank you very much for all your time, and I hope everybody out there enjoyed this podcast. We'll be back next week for another edition and to talk a lot about the news and notes that happened during the winter meetings. Guys, thank you once again, and have a great week until then. We'll talk to you then. Bye-bye.